Section 5 of the State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Spoken For. State of the Union Address, Millard Fillmore, December 2nd, 1851, Part 1. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, I congratulate you and our common constituency upon the favorable auspices under which you meet for your first session. Our country is at peace with all the world. The agitation which for a time threatened to disturb the fraternal relations which make us one people is fast subsiding, and a year of general prosperity and health has crowned the nation with unusual blessings. None can look back to the dangers which are past, or forward to the bright prospect before us, without feeling a thrill of gratification, at the same time that he must be impressed with a grateful sense of our profound obligations to a beneficent providence, whose paternal care is so manifest in the happiness of this highly favored land. Since the close of the last Congress, certain Cubans and other foreigners resident in the United States, who were more or less concerned in the previous invasion of Cuba, instead of being discouraged by its failure, have again abused the hospitality of this country by making it the scene of the equipment of another military expedition against that possession of her Catholic Majesty, in which they were countenanced, aided, and joined by citizens of the United States. On receiving intelligence that such designs were entertained, I lost no time in issuing such instructions to the proper officers of the United States, as seemed to be called for by the occasion. By the proclamation, a copy of which is herewith submitted, I also warned those who might be in danger of being inveigled into this scheme of its unlawful character, and of the penalties which they would incur. For some time there was reason to hope that these measures had sufficed to prevent any such attempt. This hope, however, proved to be delusive. Very early in the morning of the 3rd of August, a steamer called the Pempero departed from New Orleans for Cuba, having on board upward of 400 armed men, with evident intentions to make war upon the authorities of the island. This expedition was set on foot in palpable violation of the laws of the United States. Its leader was a Spaniard, and several of the chief officers and some others engaged in it were foreigners. The persons composing it, however, were mostly citizens of the United States. Before the expedition set out, and probably before it was organized, a slight insurrectionary movement, which appears to have been soon suppressed, had taken place in the eastern quarter of Cuba. The importance of this movement was, unfortunately, so much exaggerated in the accounts of it published in this country, that these adventurers seem to have been led to believe that the Creole population of the island not only desired to throw off the authority of the mother country, but had resolved upon that step and had begun a well-concerted enterprise for effecting it. The persons engaged in the expedition were generally young and ill-informed. The steamer in which they embarked left New Orleans stealthily and without a clearance. After touching at Key West, she proceeded to the coast of Cuba, and on the night between the 11th and 12th of August landed the persons on board at Clytus, within about twenty leagues of Havana. The main body of them proceeded to and took possession of an island village six leagues distant, leaving others to follow in charge of the baggage as soon as the means of transportation could be obtained. The latter, having taken up their line of march to connect themselves with the main body, and having proceeded about four leagues into the country, were attacked on the morning of the 13th by a body of Spanish troops, and a bloody conflict ensued, after which they retreated to the place of disembarkation, where about fifty of them obtained boats and re-embarked therein. They were, however, intercepted among the keys near the shore by a Spanish steamer cruising on the coast, captured and carried to Havana, and after being examined before a military court, were sentenced to be publicly executed, and the sentence was carried into effect on the 16th of August. 
On receiving information of what had occurred, Commodore Foxhall A. Parker was instructed to proceed in the steam frigate Saranac to Havana and inquire into the charges against the persons executed, the circumstances under which they were taken, and whatsoever referred to their trial and sentence. Copies of the instructions from the Department of State to him and of his letters to that department are herewith submitted. According to the record of the examination, the prisoners all admitted the offenses charged against them of being hostile invaders of the island. At the time of their trial and execution, the main body of the invaders was still in the field making war upon the Spanish authorities and Spanish subjects. After the lapse of some days, being overcome by the Spanish troops, they dispersed on the 24th of August. Lopez, their leader, was captured some days after and executed on the 1st of September. Many of his remaining followers were killed or died of hunger and fatigue, and the rest were made prisoners. Of these, none appear to have been tried or executed. Several of them were pardoned upon application of their friends and others and the rest, about 160 in number, were sent to Spain. Of the final disposition made of these, we have no official information. Such is the melancholy result of this illegal and ill-fated expedition. Thus, thoughtless young men have been induced by false and fraudulent representations to violate the law of their country, through rash and unfounded expectations of assisting to accomplish political revolutions in other states and have lost their lives in the undertaking. Too severe a judgment can hardly be passed by the indignant sense of the community upon those who, being better informed themselves, have yet led away the ardor of youth and an ill-directed love of political liberty. The correspondence between this government and that of Spain relating to this transaction is herewith communicated. Although these offenders against the laws have forfeited the protection of their country, yet the government may, so far as consistent with its obligations to other countries, and its fixed purpose to maintain and enforce the laws, entertain sympathy for their unoffending families and friends, as well as a feeling of compassion for themselves. Accordingly, no proper effort has been spared, and none will be spared, to procure the release of such citizens of the United States engaged in this unlawful enterprise, as are now in confinement in Spain. But it is to be hoped that such interposition with the government of that country may not be considered as affording any ground of expectation that the government of the United States will hereafter feel itself under any obligation of duty to intercede for the liberation or pardon of such persons as are flagrant offenders against the law of nations, and the laws of the United States. These laws must be executed. If we desire to maintain our respectability among the nations of the earth, it behooves us to enforce steadily and sternly the neutrality acts passed by Congress, and to follow, as far as may be, the violation of those acts with condign punishment. But what gives a peculiar criminality to this invasion of Cuba is that, under the lead of Spanish subjects, and with the aid of citizens of the United States, it had its origin with many in motives of cupidity. Money was advanced by individuals, probably in considerable amounts, to purchase Cuban bonds, as they have been called, issued by Lopez, sold, doubtless, at a very large discount, and for the payment of which the public lands and public property of Cuba, of whatever kind, and the fiscal resources of the people and government of that island, from whatever source to be derived, were pledged, as well as the good faith of the government expected to be established. All these means of payment, it is evident, were only to be obtained by a process of bloodshed, war, and revolution. None will deny that those who set on foot military expeditions against foreign states by means like these, are far more culpable than the ignorant and the necessitous to whom they induce to go forth as the ostensible parties in the proceeding. These originators of the invasion of Cuba seem to have determined with coolness and system upon an undertaking which should disgrace their country, violate its laws, and put to hazard the lives of ill-informed and deluded men. You will consider whether further legislation be necessary to prevent the perpetration of such offenses in future. 
No individuals have a right to hazard the peace of the country or to violate its laws upon vague notions of altering or reforming governments in other states. This principle is not only reasonable in itself and in accordance with public law, but is engrafted into the codes of other nations as well as our own. But while such are the sentiments of this government, it may be added that every independent nation must be presumed to be able to defend its possessions against unauthorized individuals banded together to attack them. The government of the United States, at all times since its establishment, has abstained and has sought to restrain the citizens of the country from entering into controversies between other powers, and to observe all the duties of neutrality. At an early period of the government, in the administration of Washington, several laws were passed for this purpose. The main provisions of these laws were re-enacted by the Act of April 1818, by which, amongst other things, it was declared that if any person shall, within the territory or jurisdiction of the United States, begin, or set on foot, or provide or prepare the means for, any military expedition or enterprise, to be carried on from thence against the territory or dominions of any foreign prince or state, or of any colony, district, or people, with whom the United States are at peace. Every person so offending shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor, and shall be fined not exceeding three thousand dollars, and imprisoned not more than three years. And this law has been executed and enforced to the full extent of the power of the government from that day to this. In proclaiming and adhering to the doctrine of neutrality and non-intervention, the United States have not followed the lead of other civilized nations. They have taken the lead themselves, and have been followed by others. This was admitted by one of the most eminent of modern British statesmen, who said in Parliament, while a minister of the Crown, quote, that if he wished for a guide and a system of neutrality, he should take that laid down by America in the days of Washington and the secretaryship of Jefferson, unquote. And we see, in fact, that the Act of Congress of 1818 was followed the succeeding year by an Act of the Parliament of England, substantially the same in its general provisions. Up to that time there had been no similar law in England, except certain highly penal statutes passed in the reign of George II, prohibiting English subjects from enlisting in foreign service, the avowed object of which statutes was that foreign armies, raised for the purpose of restoring the House of Stuart to the throne, should not be strengthened by recruits from England herself. All must see that difficulties may arise in carrying the laws referred to in execution in a country now having 3,000 or 4,000 miles of sea coast, with an infinite number of ports and harbors and small inlets, from some of which unlawful expeditious may suddenly set forth without the knowledge of government, against the possessions of foreign states. Friendly relations with all, but entangling alliances with none, has long been a maxim with us. Our true mission is not to propagate our opinions, or to impose upon other countries our form of government, by artifice or force, but to teach by example, and show by our success, moderation, and justice, the blessings of self-government, and the advantages of free institutions. Let every people choose for itself, and make and alter its political institutions to suit its own condition and convenience. But while we avow and maintain this neutral policy ourselves, we are anxious to see the same forbearance on the part of other nations, whose forms of government are different from our own. The deep interest which we feel in the spread of liberal principles and the establishment of free governments, and the sympathy with which we witness every struggle against oppression, forbid that we should be indifferent to a case in which the strong arm of a foreign power is invoked to stifle public sentiment and repress the spirit of freedom in any country. The governments of Great Britain and France have issued orders to their naval commanders on the West India Station to prevent, by force if necessary, the landing of adventurers from any nation on the island of Cuba with hostile intent. 
the copy of a memorandum of a conversation on this subject between the charge d'affaires of her britannic majesty and the acting secretary of state and of a subsequent note of the former to the department of state are herewith submitted together with a copy of a note of the acting secretary of state to the minister of the french republic and of the reply of the latter on the same subject these papers will acquaint you with the grounds of this interposition of two leading commercial powers of europe and with the apprehensions which this government could not fail to entertain that such interposition if carried into effect might lead to abuses in derogation of the maritime rights of the united states the maritime rights of the united states are founded on a firm secure and well-defined basis they stand upon the ground of national independence and public law and will be maintained in all their full and just extent the principle which this government has heretofore solemnly announced it still adheres to and will maintain under all circumstances and at all hazards that principle is that in every regularly documented merchant vessel the crew who navigate it and those on board of it will find their protection in the flag which is over them no american ship can be allowed to be visited or searched for the purpose of ascertaining the character of individuals on board nor can there be allowed any watch by the vessels of any foreign nation over american vessels on the coast of the united states or the seas adjacent thereto it will be seen by the last communication from the british charged affairs to the department of state that he is authorized to assure the secretary of state that every care will be taken that in executing the preventive measures against the expeditions which the united states government itself has denounced as not being entitled to the protection of any government no interference shall take place with the lawful commerce of any nation in addition to the correspondence on this subject herewith submitted official information has been received at the department of state of assurances by the french government that in the orders given to the french naval forces they were expressly instructed in any operations they might engage in to respect the flag of the united states wherever it might appear and to commit no act of hostility upon any vessel or armament under its protection ministers and consuls of foreign nations are the means and agents of communication between us and those nations and it is of the utmost importance that while residing in the country they should feel a perfect security so long as they faithfully discharge their respective duties and are guilty of no violation of our laws this is the admitted law of nations and no country has a deeper interest in maintaining it than the united states our commerce spreads over every sea and visits every clime and our ministers and consuls are appointed to protect the interests of that commerce as well as to guard the peace of the country and maintain the honor of its flag but how can they discharge these duties unless they be themselves protected and if protected it must be by the laws of the country in which they reside and what is due to our own public functionaries residing in foreign nations is exactly the measure of what is due to the functionaries of other governments residing here as in war the bearers of flags of truce are sacred or else wars would be interminable so in peace ambassadors public ministers and consuls charged with friendly national intercourse are objects of especial respect and protection each according to the rights belonging to his rank and station in view of these important principles it is with deep mortification and regret i announce to you that during the excitement growing out of the executions at havana the office of her catholic majesty's consul at new orleans was assailed by a mob his property destroyed the spanish flag found in the office carried off and torn in pieces and he himself induced to flee for his personal safety which he supposed to be in danger on receiving intelligence of these events i forthwith directed the attorney of the united states residing at new orleans to inquire into the facts and the extent of the pecuniary loss sustained by the consul with the intention of laying them before you that you might make provision for such indemnity to him as a just regard for the honor of the nation and the respect which is due to a friendly power 
might, in your judgment, seem to require. The correspondence upon this subject between the Secretary of State and Her Catholic Majesty's Minister Plenipotentiary is herewith transmitted. The occurrence at New Orleans has led me to give my attention to the state of our laws in regard to foreign ambassadors, ministers, and consuls. I think the legislation of the country is deficient in not providing sufficiently either for the protection or the punishment of consuls. I therefore recommend the subject to the consideration of Congress. Your attention is again invited to the question of reciprocal trade between the United States and Canada and other British possessions near our frontier. Overtures for a convention upon this subject have been received from Her Britannic Majesty's Minister Plenipotentiary, but it seems to be in many respects preferable that the matter should be regulated by reciprocal legislation. Documents are laid before you showing the terms which the British government is willing to offer and the measures which it may adopt if some arrangement upon this subject shall not be made. From the accompanying copy of a note from the British legation at Washington and the reply of the Department at State thereto, it will appear that Her Britannic Majesty's government is desirous that a part of the boundary line between Oregon and the British possessions should be authoritatively marked out, and that an intention was expressed to apply to Congress for an appropriation to defray the expense thereof on the part of the United States. Your attention to this subject is accordingly invited, and a proper appropriation recommended. A convention for the adjustment of claims of citizens of the United States against Portugal has been concluded, and the ratifications have been exchanged. The first installment of the amount to be paid by Portugal fell due on the 30th of September last, and has been paid. The President of the French Republic, according to the provisions of the convention, has been selected as arbiter in the case of the General Armstrong and has signified that he accepts the trust and the high satisfaction he feels in acting as the common friend of two nations with which France is united, by sentiments of sincere and lasting amity. The Turkish government has expressed its thanks for the kind reception given to the Sultan's agent, Amin Bey, on the occasion of his recent visit to the United States. On the 28th of February last, a dispatch was addressed by the Secretary of State to Mr. Marsh, the American minister at Constantinople, instructing him to ask of the Turkish government permission for the Hungarians then imprisoned within the dominions of the Sublime Port to remove to this country. On the 3rd of March last, both houses of Congress passed a resolution requesting the President to authorize the employment of a public vessel to convey to this country Louis Kossuth and his associates in captivity. The instruction above referred to was complied with, and the Turkish government having released Governor Kossuth and his companions from prison, on the 10th of September last they embarked on board of the United States steam frigate Mississippi, which was selected to carry into effect the resolution of Congress. Governor Kossuth left the Mississippi at Gibraltar for the purpose of making a visit to England, and may shortly be expected in New York. By communications to the Department of State, he has expressed his grateful acknowledgments for the interposition of this government in behalf of himself and his associates. This country has been justly regarded as a safe asylum for those whom political events have exiled from their own homes in Europe and it is recommended to Congress to consider in what manner Governor Kossuth and his companions, brought hither by its authority, shall be received and treated. It is earnestly to be hoped that the differences which have for some time past been pending between the government of the French Republic and that of the Sandwich Islands may be peaceably and durably adjusted so as to secure the independence of those islands. Long before the events which have of late imparted so much importance to the possessions of the United States on the Pacific, we acknowledged the independence of the Hawaiian government. This government was first in taking that step, and several of the leading powers in Europe immediately followed. We were influenced in this measure by the existing and prospective importance of the islands as a place of refuge and refreshment for our vessels engaged in the whale fishery 
and by the consideration that they lie in the course of the great trade, which must at no distant day be carried on between the western coast of North America and eastern Asia. We were also influenced by a desire that those islands should not pass under the control of any other great maritime state, but should remain in an independent condition, and so be accessible and useful to the commerce of all nations. I need not say that the importance of these considerations has been greatly enhanced by the sudden and vast development which the interests of the United States have attained in California and Oregon, and the policy heretofore adopted in regard to those islands will be steadily pursued. It is gratifying not only to those who consider the commercial interests of nations, but also to all who favor the progress of knowledge and the diffusion of religion, to see a community emerge from a savage state and attain such a degree of civilization in those distant seas. It is much to be deplored that the internal tranquility of the Mexican Republic should again be seriously disturbed, for since the peace between that republic and the United States it had enjoyed such comparative repose that the most favorable anticipations for the future might with a degree of confidence have been indulged. These, however, have been thwarted by the recent outbreak in the state of Tamaulipas on the right bank of the Rio Bravo. Having received information that persons from the United States had taken part in the insurrection, and apprehending that their example might be followed by others, I caused orders to be issued for the purpose of preventing any hostile expeditions against Mexico from being set on foot in violation of the laws of the United States. I likewise issued a proclamation upon the subject, a copy of which is herewith laid before you. This appeared to be rendered imperative by the obligations of treaties and the general duties of good neighborhood. In my last annual message I informed Congress that citizens of the United States had undertaken the connection of the two oceans by means of a railroad across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, under a grant of the Mexican government to a citizen of that republic, and that this enterprise would probably be prosecuted with energy whenever Mexico should consent to such stipulations with the government of the United States, as should impart a feeling of security to those who should invest their property in the enterprise. A convention between the two governments for the accomplishment of that end has been ratified by this government, and only awaits the decision of the Congress and the executive of that republic. Some unexpected difficulties and delays have arisen in the ratification of that convention by Mexico, but it is to be presumed that her decision will be governed by just and enlightened views, as well of the general importance of the object as of her own interests and obligations. In negotiating upon this important subject, this government has had in view one and only one object. That object has been, and is, the construction or attainment of a passage from ocean to ocean, the shortest and the best for travelers and merchandise, and equally open to all the world. It has sought to obtain no territorial acquisition, nor any advantages peculiar to itself, and it would see with the greatest regret that Mexico should oppose any obstacle to the accomplishment of an enterprise which promises so much convenience to the whole commercial world and such eminent advantages to Mexico herself. Impressed with these sentiments and these convictions, the government will continue to exert all proper efforts to bring about the necessary arrangement with the Republic of Mexico for the speedy completion of the work. For some months past, the Republic of Nicaragua has been the theater of one of those civil convulsions from which the cause of free institutions and the general prosperity and social progress of the states of Central America have so often and so severely suffered. Until quiet shall have been restored, and a government apparently stable shall have been organized, no advance can prudently be made in disposing of the questions pending between the two countries. I am happy to announce that an interoceanic communication from the mouth of the St. John to the Pacific has been so far accomplished as that passengers have actually traversed it, and merchandise has been transported over it and when the canal shall have been completed according to the original plan, the means of communication will be further improved. 
It is understood that a considerable part of the railroad across the Isthmus of Panama has been completed, and that the mail and passengers will in future be conveyed thereon. Whichever of the several routes between the two oceans may ultimately prove most eligible for travelers to and from the different states on the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, and our coast on the Pacific, there is little reason to doubt that all of them will be useful to the public, and will liberally reward that individual enterprise by which alone they have been or are expected to be carried into effect. Peace has been concluded between the contending parties in the island of St. Domingo, and, it is hoped, upon a durable basis. Such is the extent of our commercial relations with that island, that the United States cannot fail to feel a strong interest in its tranquillity. The office of Commissioner to China remains unfilled. Several persons have been appointed, and the place has been offered to others, all of whom have declined its acceptance on the ground of the inadequacy of the compensation. The annual allowance by law is $6,000, and there is no provision for any outfit. I earnestly recommend the consideration of this subject to Congress. Our commerce with China is highly important, and is becoming more and more so in consequence of the increasing intercourse between our ports on the Pacific coast and eastern Asia. China is understood to be a country in which living is very expensive, and I know of no reason why the American commissioner sent thither should not be placed, in regard to compensation, on an equal footing with ministers who represent this country at the courts of Europe. By reference to the report to the Secretary of Treasury, it will be seen that the aggregate receipts for the last fiscal year amounted to fifty-two million. $312,979.87, which, with a balance in the Treasury on the 1st July, 1850, gave as the available means for the year the sum of $58,917,524.36. The total expenditures for the same period were $48,000,000, $5,878.68. The total imports for the year ending June thirtieth, 1851, were $215,725,995, of which there were in specie $4,967,901. The exports for the same period were two hundred seventeen million five hundred seventeen thousand one hundred thirty dollars of which there were of domestic products one hundred seventy eight million five hundred forty six thousand five hundred fifty five dollars foreign goods re-exported nine million seven hundred thirty eight thousand six hundred ninety five dollars specie twenty nine million two hundred thirty one thousand eight hundred eighty dollars since the 1st of December last, the payments in cash on account of the public debt, exclusive of interest, have amounted to $7,501,456.56, which, however, includes the sum of $3,242,400, paid under the 12th article of the Treaty with Mexico, and the further sum of $2,591,213.45 being the amount of awards to American citizens under the late treaty with Mexico, for which the issue of stock was authorized, but which was paid in cash from the Treasury. The public debt on the 20th Ultimo, exclusive of the stock authorized to be issued to Texas by the Act of 9th September 1850, was $62,560,395.26. The receipts for the next fiscal year are estimated at $51,800,000, which, with a probable unappropriated balance in the Treasury on the 30th June next, will give as the probable available means for that year the sum of $63,258,743.09. It has been deemed proper, in view of the large expenditures consequent upon the acquisition of territory from Mexico, 
that the estimates for the next fiscal year should be laid before Congress in such manner as to distinguish the expenditures so required from the otherwise ordinary demands upon the Treasury. The total expenditures for the next fiscal year are estimated at $42,892,299.19, of which there is required for the ordinary purposes of the government, other than those consequent upon the acquisition of our new territories, and deducting the payments on account of the public debt, the sum of $33,343,198.08, and for the purposes connected directly or indirectly with those territories and in the fulfillment of the obligations of the government contracted in consequence of their acquisition, the sum of $9,549,101.11. If the views of the Secretary of the Treasury in reference to the expenditures required for these territories shall be met by corresponding action on the part of Congress, and appropriations made in accordance therewith, there will be an estimated unappropriated balance in the Treasury on the 30th June 1853 of $20,366,443.90, wherewith to meet that portion of the public debt due on the 1st of July following, amounting to $6,237,931.35, as well as any appropriations which may be made beyond the estimates. In thus referring to the estimated expenditures on account of our newly acquired territories, I may express the hope that Congress will concur with me in the desire that a liberal course of policy may be pursued toward them, and that every obligation, express or implied, entered into in consequence of their acquisition, shall be fulfilled by the most liberal appropriations for that purpose. The values of our domestic exports for the last fiscal year, as compared with those of the previous year, exhibit an increase of $43,646,322. At first view, this condition of our trade with foreign nations would seem to present the most flattering hopes of its future prosperity. An examination of the details of our exports, however, will show that the increased value of our exports for the last fiscal year is to be found in the high price of cotton, which prevailed during the first half of that year, which price has since declined about one half. The value of our exports of breadstuffs and provisions which it was supposed the incentive of a low tariff and large importations from abroad would have greatly augmented, has fallen from $68,701,921 in 1847 to $26,051,373 in 1850 and to $21,948,653 in 1851, with a strong probability, amounting almost to a certainty, of a still further reduction in the current year. The aggregate values of rice exported during the last fiscal year, as compared with the previous year, also exhibit a decrease, amounting to $460,917, which, with a decline in the values of the exports of tobacco for the same period, make an aggregate decrease in these two articles, of $1,156,751. The policy which dictated a low rate of duties on foreign merchandise, it was thought by those who promoted and established it, would tend to benefit the farming population of this country by increasing the demand and raising the price of agricultural products in foreign markets. The foregoing facts, however, seem to show incontestably that no such result has followed the adoption of this policy. On the contrary, notwithstanding the repeal of the restrictive corn laws in England, the foreign demand for the products of the American farmer has steadily declined, since the short crops and consequent famine in a portion of Europe have been happily replaced by full crops and comparative abundance of food. It will be seen by recurring to the commercial statistics for the past year that the value of our domestic exports has been increased in the single item of raw cotton by $40 million over the value of that export for the year preceding. 
This is not due to any increased general demand for that article, but to the short crop of the preceding year which created an increased demand and an augmented price for the crop of last year. Should the cotton crop now going forward to market be only equal in quantity to that of the year preceding, and be sold at the present prices, then there would be a falling off in the value of our exports for the present fiscal year of at least $40 million, compared with the amount exported for the year ending 30th June 1851. The production of gold in California for the past year seems to promise a large supply of that metal from that quarter for some time to come. This large annual increase of the currency of the world must be attended with its usual results. These have been already partially disclosed in the enhancement of prices and the rising spirit of speculation and adventure, tending to over-trading, as well at home as abroad. Unless some salutary check shall be given to these tendencies, it is to be feared that importations of foreign goods, beyond a healthy demand in this country, will lead to a sudden drain of the precious metals from us, bringing with it, as it has done in former times, the most disastrous consequences to the business and capital of the American people. The exports of specie to liquidate our foreign debt during the past fiscal year have been $24,963,979 over the amount of specie imported. The exports of specie during the first quarter of the present fiscal year have been 14 million six hundred and fifty one thousand eight hundred twenty seven should specie continue to be exported at this rate for the remaining three quarters of this year it will drain from our metallic currency during the year ending thirtieth june eighteen fifty two the enormous amount of fifty eight million six hundred seven thousand three hundred eight dollars in the present prosperous condition of the national finances, it will become the duty of Congress to consider the best mode of paying off the public debt. If the present and anticipated surplus in the Treasury should not be absorbed by appropriations of an extraordinary character, this surplus should be employed in such way and under such restrictions as Congress may enact in extinguishing the outstanding debt of the nation." By reference to the Act of Congress, approved 9th September 1850, it will be seen that, in consideration of certain concessions by the State of Texas, it is provided that the United States shall pay to the State of Texas the sum of $10 million in a stock bearing 5% interest and redeemable at the end of 14 years, the interest payable half-yearly at the Treasury of the United States. In the same section of the law, it is further provided that no more than five millions of said stock shall be issued until the creditors of the state holding bonds and other certificates of stock of Texas, for which duties on imports were specially pledged, shall first file at the Treasury of the United States releases of all claims against the United States for or on account of said bonds or certificates in such form as shall be prescribed by the Secretary of the Treasury and approved by the President of the United States. The form of release thus provided for has been prescribed by the Secretary of the Treasury and approved. It has been published in all the leading newspapers in the commercial cities of the United States, and all persons holding claims of the kind specified in the foregoing proviso were required to file their releases in the form thus prescribed in the Treasury of the United States, on or before the first day of October, 1851. Although this publication has been continued from the 25th day of March, 1851, yet up to the first of October last, comparatively few releases had been filed by the creditors of Texas. The authorities of the State of Texas, at the request of the Secretary of the Treasury, have furnished a schedule of the public debt of that state, created prior to her admission into the Union, with a copy of the laws under which each class was contracted. I have, from the documents furnished by the State of Texas, determined the classes of claims which, in my judgment, fall within the provisions of the Act of Congress of the 9th of September, 1850. On being officially informed of the acceptance of Texas of the propositions contained in the Act referred to, 
I caused the stock to be prepared, and the five millions which are to be issued unconditionally, bearing an interest of five per cent from the first day of January 1851, have been for some time ready to be delivered to the state of Texas. The authorities of Texas, up to the present time, have not authorized anyone to receive this stock, and it remains in the Treasury Department subject to the order of Texas. The releases required by law to be deposited in the Treasury not having been filed there, the remaining five millions have not been issued. This last amount of the stock will be withheld from Texas until the conditions upon which it is to be delivered shall be complied with by the creditors of that state, unless Congress shall otherwise direct by a modification of the law. In my last annual message, to which I respectfully refer, I stated briefly the reasons which induced me to recommend a modification of the present tariff by converting the ad valorem into a specific duty wherever the article imported was of such a character as to permit it, and that such a discrimination should be made in favor of the industrial pursuits of our own country as to encourage home production without excluding foreign competition. The numerous frauds which continue to be practiced upon the revenue by false invoices and undervaluations constitute an unanswerable reason for adopting specific instead of ad valorem duties in all cases where the nature of the commodity does not forbid it. A striking illustration of these frauds will be exhibited in the report of the Secretary of the Treasury, showing the Custom House valuation of articles imported under a former law subject to specific duties, when there was no inducement to undervaluation, and the Custom House valuations of the same articles under the present system of ad valorem duties, so greatly reduced as to leave no doubt of the existence of the most flagrant abuses under the existing laws. This practical evasion of the present law, combined with the languishing condition of some of the great interests of the country, caused by over-importations and consequent depressed prices, and with the failure in obtaining a foreign market for our increasing surplus of breadstuffs and provisions, has induced me again to recommend a modification of the existing tariff. The report of the Secretary of the Interior, which accompanies this communication, will present a condensed statement of the operations of that important department of the government. End of section 5section 6 of state of the union addresses 1849 to 1856 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mark ernest president millard fillmore december 2nd 1851 part 2 it will be seen that the cash sales of the public lands exceed those of the preceding year, and that there is reason to anticipate a still further increase, notwithstanding the large donations which have been made to many of the states and the liberal grants to individuals as a reward for military services. This fact furnishes very gratifying evidence of the growing wealth and prosperity of our country. Suitable measures have been adopted for commencing the survey of the public lands in California and Oregon. Surveying parties have been organized and some progress has been made in establishing the principal base and meridian lines. But further legislation and additional appropriations will be necessary before the proper subdivisions can be made and the general land system extended over those remote parts of our territory. On the 3rd of March last, an act was passed providing for the appointment of three commissioners to settle private land claims in California. Three persons were immediately appointed, all of whom, however, declined accepting the office in consequence of the inadequacy of the compensation. Others were promptly selected, who, for the same reason, also declined. And it was not until late in the season that the services of suitable persons could be secured. A majority of the commissioners convened in this city on the 10th of September last, when detailed instructions were given to them in regard to their duties. 
Their first meeting for the transaction of business will be held in San Francisco on the eighth day of the present month. I have thought it proper to refer to these facts, not only to explain the causes of the delay in filling the commission, but to call your attention to the propriety of increasing the compensation of the commissioners. The office is one of great labor and responsibility, and the compensation should be such as to command men of a high order of talents and the most unquestionable integrity. The proper disposal of the mineral lands of California is a subject surrounded by great difficulties. In my last annual message, I recommended the survey and sale of them in small parcels under such restrictions as would effectually guard against monopoly and speculation. But upon further information, and in deference to the opinions of persons familiar with the subject, I am inclined to change that recommendation and to advise that they be permitted to remain as at present a common field, open to the enterprise and industry of all our citizens, until further experience shall have developed the best policy to be ultimately adopted in regard to them. It is safer to suffer the inconveniences that now exist for a short period than by premature legislation to fasten on the country a system founded in error, which may place the whole subject beyond the future control of Congress. The agricultural lands should, however, be surveyed and brought into market with as little delay as possible, that the titles may become settled and the inhabitants stimulated to make permanent improvements and enter on the ordinary pursuits of life. To effect these objects, it is desirable that the necessary provision be made by law for the establishment of land offices in California and Oregon and for the efficient prosecution of the surveys at an early day. Some difficulties have occurred in organizing the territorial governments of New Mexico and Utah, and when more accurate information shall be obtained of the causes, a further communication will be made on that subject. In my last annual communication to Congress, I recommended the establishment of an agricultural bureau, and I take this occasion again to invoke your favorable consideration of the subject. Agriculture may justly be regarded as the great interest of our people. Four-fifths of our active population are employed in the cultivation of the soil, and the rapid expansion of our settlements over new territory is daily adding to the number of those engaged in that vocation. Justice and sound policy, therefore, alike require that the government should use all the means authorized by the Constitution to promote the interests and welfare of that important class of our fellow citizens. And yet it is a singular fact that whilst the manufacturing and commercial interests have engaged the attention of Congress during a large portion of every session, and our statutes abound in provisions for their protection and encouragement, little has yet been done directly for the advancement of agriculture. It is time that this reproach to our legislation should be removed, and I sincerely hope that the present Congress will not close their labors without adopting efficient means to supply the omissions of those who have preceded them. An agricultural bureau, charged with the duty of collecting and disseminating correct information as to the best modes of cultivation and of the most effectual means of preserving and restoring the fertility of the soil and of procuring and distributing seeds and plants and other vegetable productions with instructions in regard to the soil, climate, and treatment best adapted to their growth could not fail to be, in the language of Washington in his last annual message to Congress, a very cheap instrument of immense national benefit. Regarding the Act of Congress approved 28th September 1850, granting bounty lands to persons who had been engaged in the military service of the country, as a great measure of national justice and munificence, an anxious desire has been felt by the officers entrusted with its immediate execution to give prompt effect to its provisions. All the means within their control were therefore brought into requisition to expedite the adjudication of claims, and I am gratified to be able to state that near 100,000 applications have been considered and about 70,000 warrants issued within the short space of nine months. If adequate provision be made by law to carry into effect the recommendations of the Department, it is confidently expected that before the close of the next fiscal year all who are entitled to the benefits of the Act will have received their warrants. The Secretary of the Interior has suggested in his report various amendments of the laws relating to pensions and bounty lands for the purpose of more effectually guarding against abuses and frauds on the government 
to all of which I invite your particular attention, the large accessions to our Indian population consequent upon the acquisition of New Mexico and California, and the extension of our settlements into Utah and Oregon, have given increased interest and importance to our relations with the aboriginal race. No material change has taken place within the last year in the condition and prospects of the Indian tribes who reside in the Northwestern Territory and west of the Mississippi River. We are at peace with all of them, and it will be a source of pleasure to you to learn that they are gradually advancing in civilization and the pursuits of social life. Along the Mexican frontier, and in California and Oregon, there have been occasional manifestations of unfriendly feeling and some depredations committed. I am satisfied, however, that they resulted more from the destitute and starving condition of the Indians than from any settled hostility toward the whites. As the settlements of our citizens progress towards them, the game, upon which they mainly rely for subsistence, is driven off or destroyed, and the only alternative left to them is starvation or plunder. It becomes us to consider, in view of this condition of things, whether justice and humanity, as well as an enlightened economy, do not require that instead of seeking to punish them for offenses which are the result of our own policy toward them, we should not provide for their immediate wants and encourage them to engage in agriculture and to rely on their labor instead of the chase for the means of support. Various important treaties have been negotiated with different tribes during the year, by which their title to large and valuable tracts of country has been extinguished, all of which will at the proper time be submitted to the Senate for ratification. The Joint Commission under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo has been actively engaged in running and marking the boundary line between the United States and Mexico. It was stated in the last annual report of the Secretary of the Interior that the initial point on the Pacific and the point of junction of the Gila with the Colorado River had been determined and the intervening line, about 150 miles in length, run and marked by temporary monuments. Since that time, a monument of marble has been erected at the initial point, and permanent landmarks of iron have been placed at suitable distances along the line. The initial point on the Rio Grande has also been fixed by the commissioners at latitude 32 degrees 22 minutes, and at the date of the last communication, the survey of the line had been made thence westward about 150 miles to the neighborhood of the copper mines. The commission on our part was at first organized on a scale which experience proved to be unwieldy and attended with unnecessary expense. Orders have therefore been issued for the reduction of the number of persons employed within the smallest limits consistent with the safety of those engaged in the service and the prompt and efficient execution of their important duties. Returns have been received from all the officers engaged in taking the census in the states and territories except California. The superintendent employed to make the enumeration in that state has not yet made his full report from causes, as he alleges, beyond his control. This failure is much to be regretted as it has prevented the Secretary of the Interior from making the decennial apportionment of representatives among the states as required by the Act approved May 23, 1850. It is hoped, however, that the returns will soon be received and no time will then be lost in making the necessary apportionment and in transmitting the certificates required by law. The superintendent of the 7th Census is diligently employed, under the direction of the Secretary of the Interior, in classifying and arranging in tabular form all the statistical information derived from the returns of the marshals, and it is believed that when the work shall be completed it will exhibit a more perfect view of the population, wealth, occupations, and social condition of a great country than has ever been presented to the world. The value of such a work as the basis of enlightened legislation can hardly be overestimated, and I earnestly hope that Congress will lose no time in making the appropriations necessary to complete the classifications and to publish the results in a style worthy of the subject and of our national character. The want of a uniform fee bill prescribing the compensation to be allowed district attorneys, clerks, marshals, and commissioners in civil and criminal cases is the cause of much vexation, injustice, and complaint. I would recommend a thorough revision of the laws on the whole subject and the adoption of a tariff of fees which, as far as practicable, 
should be uniform and prescribe a specific compensation for every service which the officer may be required to perform. The subject will be fully presented in the report of the Secretary of the Interior. In my last annual message, I gave briefly my reasons for believing that you possess the constitutional power to improve the harbors of our Great Lakes and sea coast and the navigation of our principal rivers, and recommended that appropriations should be made for completing such works as had already been commenced and for commencing such others as might seem to the wisdom of Congress to be of public and general importance. Without repeating the reasons then urged, I deem it my duty again to call your attention to this important subject. The works on many of the harbors were left in an unfinished state, and consequently exposed to the action of the elements, which is fast destroying them. Great numbers of lives and vast amounts of property are annually lost for want of safe and convenient harbors on the lakes. None but those who have been exposed to that dangerous navigation can fully appreciate the importance of this subject. The whole Northwest appeals to you for relief, and I trust their appeal will receive due consideration at your hands. The same is in a measure true in regard to some of the harbors and inlets on the seacoast. The unobstructed navigation of our large rivers is of equal importance. Our settlements are now extending to the sources of the great rivers which empty into and form a part of the Mississippi, and the value of the public lands in those regions would be greatly enhanced by freeing the navigation of those waters from obstructions. In view, therefore, of this great interest, I deem it my duty again to urge upon Congress to make such appropriations for these improvements as they may deem necessary. The surveys of the Delta of the Mississippi, with a view to the prevention of the overflows that have proved so disastrous to that region of country, have been nearly completed, and the reports thereof are now in course of preparation and will shortly be laid before you. The protection of our southwestern frontier and of the adjacent Mexican states against the Indian tribes within our borders has claimed my earnest and constant attention. Congress, having failed at the last session to adopt my recommendation that an additional regiment of mounted men specially adapted to that service should be raised, all that remained to be done was to make the best use of the means at my disposal. Accordingly, all the troops adapted to that service that could properly be spared from other quarters have been concentrated on that frontier and officers of high reputation selected to command them. A new arrangement of the military posts has also been made, whereby the troops are brought nearer to the Mexican frontier and to the tribes they are intended to overawe. Sufficient time has not yet elapsed to realize all the benefits that are expected to result from these arrangements, but I have every reason to hope that they will effectually check their marauding expeditions. The nature of the country, which furnishes little for the support of an army and abounds in places of refuge and concealment, is remarkably well adapted to this predatory warfare, and we can scarcely hope that any military force, combined with the greatest vigilance, can entirely suppress it. By the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, we are bound to protect the territory of Mexico against the incursions of the savage tribes within our border with equal diligence and energy as if the same were made within our territory or against our citizens. I have endeavored to comply as far as possible with this provision of the treaty. Orders have been given to the officers commanding on that frontier to consider the Mexican territory and its inhabitants as equally with our own, entitled to their protection, and to make all their plans and arrangements with a view to the attainment of this object. Instructions have also been given to the Indian commissioners and agents among these tribes in all treaties to make the clauses designed for the protection of our own citizens apply also to those of Mexico. I have no reason to doubt that these instructions have been fully carried into effect. Nevertheless, it is probable that in spite of all our efforts, some of the neighboring states of Mexico may have suffered, as our own have, from depredations by the Indians. To the difficulties of defending our own territory, as above mentioned, are superadded, in defending that of Mexico, those that arise from its remoteness, from the fact that we have no right to station our troops within her limits, and that there is no efficient military force on the Mexican side to cooperate with our own. So long as this shall continue to be the case, the number and activity of our troops will rather increase than diminish the evil, as the Indians will naturally turn toward that country, 
where they encounter the least resistance. Yet these troops are necessary to subdue them and to compel them to make and observe treaties. Until this shall have been done, neither country will enjoy any security from their attacks. The Indians in California, who had previously appeared of a peaceable character and disposed to cultivate the friendship of the whites, have recently committed several acts of hostility. As a large portion of the reinforcements sent to the Mexican frontier were drawn from the Pacific, the military force now stationed there is considered entirely inadequate to its defense. It cannot be increased, however, without an increase of the army, and I again recommend that measure as indispensable to the protection of the frontier. I invite your attention to the suggestions on this subject and on others connected with his department in the report of the Secretary of War. The appropriations for the support of the Army during the current fiscal year ending 30th June next were reduced far below the estimates submitted by the Department. The consequence of this reduction is a considerable deficiency to which I invite your early attention. The expenditures of that Department for the year ending 30th June last were $9,060,268.58. The estimates for the year commencing 1st July next and ending June 30, 1853, are $7,898,775.83, showing a reduction of $1,161,492.75. The Board of Commissioners to whom the management of the affairs of the military asylum, created by the Act of 3rd March last, was entrusted, have selected a site for the establishment of an asylum in the vicinity of this city, which has been approved by me subject to the production of a satisfactory title. The report of the Secretary of the Navy will exhibit the condition of the public service under the supervision of that department. Our naval force afloat during the present year has been actively and usefully employed in giving protection to our widely extended and increasing commerce and interests in the various quarters of the globe, and our flag has everywhere afforded the security and received the respect inspired by the justice and liberality of our intercourse and the dignity and power of the nation. The expedition commanded by Lieutenant de Haven, dispatched in search of the British commander Sir John Franklin and his companions in the Arctic seas, returned to New York in the month of October, after having undergone great peril and suffering from an unknown and dangerous navigation, and the rigors of a northern climate without any satisfactory information of the objects of their search but with new contributions to science and navigation from the unfrequented polar regions the officers and men of the expedition having been all volunteers for this service and having so conducted it as to meet the entire approbation of the government it is suggested as an act of grace and generosity that the same allowance of extra pay and emoluments be extended to them that were made to the officers and men of like rating in the late exploring expedition to the South Seas. I earnestly recommend to your attention the necessity of reorganizing the naval establishment, apportioning and fixing the number of officers in each grade, providing some mode of promotion to the higher grades of the Navy having reference to merit and capacity rather than seniority or date of entry into the service, and for retiring from the effective list upon reduced pay those who may be incompetent to the performance of active duty. As a measure of economy as well as of efficiency in this arm of the service, the provision last mentioned is eminently worthy of your consideration. The determination of the questions of relative rank between the sea officers and civil officers of the Navy, and between officers of the Army and Navy in the various grades of each, will also merit your attention. The failure to provide any substitute when corporal punishment was abolished for offenses in the Navy has occasioned the convening of numerous courts-martial upon the arrival of vessels in port, and is believed to have had an injurious effect upon the discipline and efficiency of the service. To moderate punishment from one grade to another is among the humane reforms of the age, but to abolish one of severity which applied so generally to offenses on shipboard and provide nothing in its stead is to suppose a progress of improvement in every individual among seamen which is not assumed by the legislature in respect to any other class of men it is hoped that congress in the ample opportunity afforded by the present session will thoroughly investigate this important subject and establish such modes of determining guilt and such gradations of punishment as are consistent with humanity 
and the personal rights of individuals and at the same time shall ensure the most energetic and efficient performance of duty and the suppression of crime in our ships of war the stone dock in the navy yard at new york which was ten years in process of construction has been so far finished as to be surrendered up to the authorities of the yard the dry dock at philadelphia is reported as completed and is expected soon to be tested and delivered over to the agents of the government that at portsmouth new hampshire is also nearly ready for delivery and a contract has been concluded agreeably to the act of congress at its last session for a floating sectional dock on the bay of san francisco i invite your attention to the recommendation of the department touching the establishment of a navy yard in conjunction with this dock on the pacific such a station is highly necessary to the convenience and effectiveness of our fleet in that ocean which must be expected to increase with the growth of commerce and the rapid extension of our whale fisheries over its waters the naval academy at annapolis under a revised and improved system of regulations now affords opportunities of education and instruction to the pupils quite equal it is believed for professional improvement to those enjoyed by the cadets in the military academy a large class of acting midshipmen was received at the commencement of the last academic term and a practice ship has been attached to the institution to afford the amplest means for regular instruction in seamanship as well as for cruises during the vacations of three or four months in each year the advantages of science in nautical affairs have rarely been more strikingly illustrated than in the fact stated in the report of the navy department that by means of the wind and current charts projected and prepared by lieutenant mowry the superintendent of the naval observatory the passage from the atlantic to the pacific ports of our country has been shortened by about forty days the estimates for the support of the navy and marine corps the ensuing fiscal year will be found to be five million eight hundred fifty six thousand four hundred seventy two dollars and nineteen cents the estimates for the current year being five million nine hundred thousand six hundred twenty one dollars the estimates for special objects under the control of this department amount to two million six hundred eighty four thousand two hundred twenty dollars and eighty nine cents against two million two hundred ten thousand nine hundred eighty dollars for the present year the increase being occasioned by the additional mail service on the pacific coast and the construction of the dock in california authorized at the last session of congress and some slight additions under the head of improvements and repairs in navy yards buildings and machinery i deem it of much importance to a just economy and a correct understanding of naval expenditures that there should be an entire separation of the appropriations for the support of the naval service proper from those for permanent improvements at navy yards and stations and from ocean steam mail service and other special objects assigned to the supervision of this department the report of the postmaster general herewith communicated presents an interesting view of the progress operations and condition of his department at the close of the last fiscal year the length of mail routes within the united states was one hundred ninety six thousand two hundred ninety miles the annual transportation thereon fifty three million two hundred seventy two thousand two hundred fifty two miles and the annual cost of such transportation three million four hundred twenty one thousand seven hundred fifty four dollars the length of the foreign mail routes is estimated at eighteen thousand three hundred forty nine miles and the annual transportation thereon at six hundred fifteen thousand two hundred six miles the annual cost of this service is one million four hundred seventy two thousand one hundred eighty seven dollars of which four hundred forty eight thousand nine hundred thirty seven dollars are paid by the post office department and one million twenty three thousand two hundred fifty dollars are paid through the navy department the annual transportation within the united states excluding the service in california and oregon which is now for the first time reported and embraced in the tabular statements of the department exceeds that of the preceding year six million one hundred sixty two thousand eight hundred fifty five miles at an increased cost of five hundred forty seven thousand one hundred ten dollars the whole number of post offices in the united states on the thirtieth day of june last was nineteen thousand seven hundred ninety six there were one thousand six hundred ninety eight post offices established and two hundred fifty six discontinued during the year the gross revenues of the department for the fiscal year including the appropriations for the franked matter of congress of the departments and officers of government 
and excluding the foreign postages collected for and payable to the British Post Office, amounted to $6,727,866.78. The expenditures for the same period, excluding $20,599.49 paid under an award of the auditor in pursuance of a resolution of the last Congress for mail service on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers in 1832 and 1833, and the amount paid to the British Post Office for foreign postages collected for and payable to that office amounted to $6,024,566.79, leaving a balance of revenue over the proper expenditures of the year of $703,299.99. The receipts for postages during the year, excluding the foreign postages collected for and payable to the British Post Office, amounted to $6,345,747.21, being an increase of $997,610.79, or 18.65%, over the like receipts for the preceding year. The reduction of postage under the Act of March last did not take effect until the commencement of the present fiscal year. The accounts for the first quarter under the operation of the reduced rates will not be settled before January next, and no reliable estimate of the receipts for the present year can yet be made. It is believed, however, that they will fall far short of those of the last year. The surplus of the revenues now on hand is, however, so large that no further appropriation from the Treasury in aid of the revenues of the Department is required for the current fiscal year, but an additional appropriation for the year ending June 30, 1853, will probably be found necessary when the receipts of the first two quarters of the fiscal year are fully ascertained. In his last annual report, the Postmaster General recommended a reduction of postage to rates which he deemed as low as could be prudently adopted unless Congress was prepared to appropriate from the Treasury for the support of the Department a sum more than equivalent to the mail services performed by it for the government. The recommendations of the Postmaster General in respect to letter postage, except on letters from and to California and Oregon, were substantially adopted by the last Congress. He now recommends adherence to the present letter rates and advises against a further reduction until justified by the revenue of the Department. He also recommends that the rates of postage on printed matter be so revised as to render them more simple and more uniform in their operation upon all classes of printed matter. I submit the recommendations of the report to your favorable consideration. The public statutes of the United States have now been accumulating for more than 60 years and, interspersed with private acts, are scattered through numerous volumes and, from the cost of the whole, have become almost inaccessible to the great mass of the community. They also exhibit much of the incongruity and imperfection of hasty legislation. As it seems to be generally conceded that there is no common law of the United States to supply the defects of their legislation, it is most important that that legislation should be as perfect as possible, defining every power intended to be conferred, every crime intended to be made punishable, and prescribing the punishment to be inflicted. In addition to some particular cases spoken of more at length, the whole criminal code is now lamentably defective. Some offenses are imperfectly described and others are entirely omitted, so that flagrant crimes may be committed with impunity. The scale of punishment is not in all cases graduated according to the degree and nature of the offense and is often rendered more unequal by the different modes of imprisonment or penitentiary confinement in the different states. Many laws of a permanent character have been introduced into appropriation bills and it is often difficult to determine whether the particular clause expires with the temporary act of which it is a part or continues in force. It has also frequently happened that enactments and provisions of law have been introduced into bills with the title or general subject of which they have little or no connection or relation. In this mode of legislation, so many enactments have been heaped upon each other, and often with but little consideration, that in many instances it is difficult to search out and determine what is the law. The government of the United States is emphatically a government of written laws. These statutes should, therefore, as far as practicable, not only be made accessible to all, 
but be expressed in language so plain and simple as to be understood by all and arranged in such method as to give perspicuity to every subject many of the states have revised their public acts with great and manifest benefit and i recommend that provision be made by law for the appointment of a commission to revise the public statutes of the united states arranging them in order supplying deficiencies correcting incongruities simplifying their language and reporting them to congress for its action an act of congress approved thirtieth september eighteen fifty contained a provision for the extension of the capital according to such plan as might be approved by the president and appropriated one hundred thousand dollars to be expended under his direction by such architect as he should appoint to execute the same on examining the various plans which had been submitted by different architects in pursuance of an advertisement by a committee of the senate no one was found to be entirely satisfactory and it was therefore deemed advisable to combine and adopt the advantages of several the great object to be accomplished was to make such an addition as would afford ample and convenient halls for the deliberations of the two houses of congress with sufficient accommodations for spectators and suitable apartments for the committees and officers of the two branches of the legislature it was also desirable not to mar the harmony and beauty of the present structure which as a specimen of architecture is so universally admired keeping these objects in view i concluded to make the addition by wings detached from the present building yet connected with it by corridors this mode of enlargement will leave the present capital uninjured and afford great advantages for ventilation and the admission of light and will enable the work to progress without interrupting the deliberations of congress to carry this plan into effect i have appointed an experienced and competent architect the cornerstone was laid on the fourth day of july last with suitable ceremonies since which time the work has advanced with commendable rapidity and the foundations of both wings are now nearly complete i again commend to your favorable regard the interest of the district of columbia and deem it only necessary to remind you that although its inhabitants have no voice in the choice of representatives in congress they are not the less entitled to a just and liberal consideration in your legislation my opinions on this subject were more fully expressed in my last annual communication other subjects were brought to the attention of congress in my last annual message to which i would respectfully refer but there was one of more than ordinary interest to which i again invite your special attention i allude to the recommendation for the appointment of a commission to settle private claims against the united states justice to individuals as well as to the government imperatively demands that some more convenient and expeditious mode than an appeal to congress should be adopted it is deeply to be regretted that in several instances officers of the government in attempting to execute the law for the return of fugitives from labor have been openly resisted and their efforts frustrated and defeated by lawless and violent mobs that in one case such resistance resulted in the death of an estimable citizen and in others serious injury ensued to those officers and to individuals who were using their endeavors to sustain the laws prosecutions have been instituted against the alleged offenders so far as they could be identified and are still pending i have regarded it as my duty in these cases to give all aid legally in my power to the enforcement of the laws and i shall continue to do so wherever and whenever their execution may be resisted the act of congress for the return of fugitives from labor is one required and demanded by the express words of the constitution the constitution declares that no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due this constitutional provision is equally obligatory upon the legislative the executive and judicial departments of the government and upon every citizen of the united states congress however must from necessity first act upon the subject by prescribing the proceedings necessary to ascertain that the person is a fugitive and the means to be used for his restoration to the claimant this was done by an act passed during the first term of president washington which was amended by that enacted by the last congress and it now remains for the executive and judicial departments to take care that these laws be faithfully executed this injunction of the constitution is as peremptory and as binding as any other it stands exactly on the same foundation as that clause which provides for the return of fugitives from justice 
or that which declares that no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed, or that which provides for an equality of taxation according to the census, or the clause declaring that all duties shall be uniform throughout the United States, or the important provision that the trial of all crimes shall be by jury. The several articles and clauses of the Constitution, all resting on the same authority, must stand or fall together. Some objections have been urged against the details of the Act for the return of fugitives from labor, but it is worthy of remark that the main opposition is aimed against the Constitution itself and proceeds from persons and classes of persons, many of whom declare their wish to see that Constitution overturned. They avow their hostility to any law which shall give full and practical effect to this requirement of the Constitution. Fortunately, the number of these persons is comparatively small and is believed to be daily diminishing, but the issue which they present is one which involves the supremacy and even the existence of the Constitution. Cases have heretofore arisen in which individuals have denied the binding authority of acts of Congress and even states have proposed to nullify such acts upon the ground that the Constitution was the supreme law of the land, and that those acts of Congress were repugnant to that instrument. But nullification is now aimed not so much against particular laws as being inconsistent with the Constitution as against the Constitution itself, and it is not to be disguised that a spirit exists and has been actively at work to rend asunder this union, which is our cherished inheritance from our revolutionary fathers. In my last annual message, I stated that I considered the series of measures which had been adopted at the previous session in reference to the agitation growing out of the territorial and slavery questions as a final settlement in principle and substance of the dangerous and exciting subjects which they embraced, and I recommended adherence to the adjustment established by those measures until time and experience should demonstrate the necessity of further legislation to guard against evasion or abuse. I was not induced to make this recommendation because I thought those measures perfect, for no human legislation can be perfect. Wide differences and jarring opinions can only be reconciled by yielding something on all sides, and this result had been reached after an angry conflict of many months in which one part of the country was arrayed against another and violent convulsions seemed to be imminent. Looking at the interests of the whole country, I felt it to be my duty to seize upon this compromise as the best that could be obtained amid conflicting interests and to insist upon it as a final settlement to be adhered to by all who value the peace and welfare of the country. A year has now elapsed since that recommendation was made. To that recommendation I still adhere, and I congratulate you and the country upon the general acquiescence in these measures of peace which has been exhibited in all parts of the Republic. And not only is there this general acquiescence in these measures, but the spirit of conciliation which has been manifested in regard to them in all parts of the country has removed doubts and uncertainties in the minds of thousands of good men concerning the durability of our popular institutions and given renewed assurance that our liberty and our union may subsist together for the benefit of this and all succeeding generations. End of Section 6 Recording by Mark Ernest Section 7 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849-1856. to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. State of the Union Address, President Millard Fillmore. December 6, 1852. Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate, and of the House of Representatives. The brief space which has elapsed since the close of your last session has been marked by no extraordinary political event. The quadrennial election of chief magistrate has passed off with less than the usual excitement. However, individuals and parties may have been disappointed in the result. It is, nevertheless, a subject of national congratulation that the choice has been effected by the independent suffrages of a free people undisturbed by those influences which in other countries have too often affected the purity of popular elections. Our grateful thanks are due to an all-merciful providence, not only for staying the pestilence which in different forms has desolated some of our cities, but for crowning the labors of the husbandman with an abundant harvest and the nation generally with the blessings of peace and prosperity. 
Within a few weeks, the public mind has been deeply affected by the death of Daniel Webster, filling at his decease the office of Secretary of State. His associates in the executive government have sincerely sympathized with his family and the public generally on this mournful occasion. His commanding talents, his great political and professional eminence, his well-tried patriotism, and his long and faithful services in the most important public trust have caused his death to be lamented throughout the country and have earned for him a lasting place in our history. In the course of the last summer, considerable anxiety was caused for a short time by an official intimation from the government of Great Britain that orders had been given for the protection of the fisheries upon the coasts of the British provinces in North America against the alleged encroachments of the fishing vessels of the United States and France. The shortness of this notice and the season of the year seemed to make it a matter of urgent importance. It was at first apprehended that an increased naval force had been ordered to the fishing grounds to carry into effect the British interpretation of those provisions in the Convention of 1818, in reference to the true intent of which the two governments differ. It was soon discovered that such was not the design of Great Britain, and satisfactory explanations of the real objects of the measure have been given both here and in London. The unadjusted difference, however, between the two governments as to the interpretation of the first article of the Convention of 1818 is still a matter of importance. American fishing vessels, within nine or ten years, have been excluded from waters to which they had free access for twenty-five years after the negotiation of the treaty. In 1845, this exclusion was relaxed so far as concerns the Bay of Fundy, but the just and liberal intention of the home government, in compliance with what we think the true construction of the convention, to open all the other outer bays to our fishermen was abandoned in consequence of the opposition of the colonies. Notwithstanding this, the United States have, since the Bay of Fundy was reopened to our fishermen in 1845, pursued the most liberal course toward the colonial fishing interests. By the Revenue Law of 1846, the duties on colonial fish entering our ports were very greatly reduced, and by the Warehousing Act it is allowed to be entered in bond without payment of duty. In this way, colonial fish has acquired the monopoly of the export trade in our market and is entering to some extent into the home consumption. These facts were among those which increased the sensibility of our fishing interest at the movement in question. These circumstances and the incidents above alluded to have led me to think the moment favorable for a reconsideration of the entire subject of the fisheries on the coasts of the British provinces, with a view to place them upon a more liberal footing of reciprocal privilege. A willingness to meet us in some arrangement of this kind is understood to exist on the part of Great Britain, with a desire on her part to include in one comprehensive settlement as well this subject as the commercial intercourse between the United States and the British provinces. I have thought that whatever arrangements may be made on these two subjects, it is expedient that they should be embraced in separate conventions. The illness and death of the late Secretary of State prevented the commencement of the contemplated negotiation. Pains have been taken to collect the information required for the details of such an arrangement. The subject is attended with considerable difficulty. If it is found practicable to come to an agreement mutually acceptable to the two parties, conventions may be concluded in the course of the present winter. The control of Congress over all the provisions of such an arrangement affecting the revenue will, of course, be reserved. The affairs of Cuba formed a prominent topic in my last annual message. They remain in an uneasy condition, and a feeling of alarm and irritation on the part of the Cuban authorities appears to exist. This feeling has interfered with the regular commercial intercourse between the United States and the island, and led to some acts of which we have a right to complain. But the Captain General of Cuba is clothed with no power to treat with foreign governments, nor is he in any degree under the control of the Spanish minister at Washington. Any communication which he may hold with an agent of a foreign power is informal and a matter of courtesy. Anxious to put an end to the existing inconveniences, which seemed to rest on a misconception, I directed the newly appointed minister to Mexico to visit Havana on his way to Veracruz. He was respectfully received by the Captain General, who conferred with him freely on the recent occurrences, but no permanent arrangement was effected. 
in the meantime the refusal of the captain general to allow passengers and the mail to be landed in certain cases for a reason which he does not furnish in the opinion of this government even a good presumptive ground for such prohibition has been made the subject of a serious remonstrance at madrid and i have no reason to doubt that due respect will be paid by the government of her catholic majesty to the representations which our minister has been instructed to make on the subject it is but justice to the captain-general to add that his conduct toward the steamers employed to carry the mails of the united states to havana has with the exceptions above alluded to been marked with kindness and liberality and indicates no general purpose of interfering with the commercial correspondence and intercourse between the island and this country early in the present year official notes were received from the ministers of france and england inviting the government of the united states to become a party with great britain and france to a tripartite convention in virtue of which the three powers should severally and collectively disclaim now and for the future all intention to obtain possession of the island of cuba and should bind themselves to discountenance all attempts to that effect on the part of any power or individual whatever this invitation has been respectfully declined for reasons which it would occupy too much space in this communication to state in detail but which led me to think that the proposed measure would be of doubtful constitutionality impolitic and unavailing i have however in common with several of my predecessors directed the ministers of france and england to be assured that the united states entertain no designs against cuba but that on the contrary i should regard its incorporation into the union at the present time as fraught with serious peril were this island comparatively destitute of inhabitants or occupied by a kindred race i should regard it if voluntarily ceded by spain as a most desirable acquisition but under existing circumstances i should look upon its incorporation into our union as a very hazardous measure it would bring into the confederacy a population of a different national stock speaking a different language and not likely to harmonize with the other members it would probably affect in a prejudicial manner the industrial interests of the south and it might revive those conflicts of opinion between the different sections of the country which lately shook the union to its centre and which have been so happily compromised the rejection by the mexican congress of the convention which had been concluded between that republic and the united states for the protection of a transit way across the isthmus of tehuanapec and of the interest of those citizens of the united states which had become proprietors of the rights which mexico had conferred on one of her own citizens in regard to that transit has thrown a serious obstacle in the way of the attainment of a very desirable national object i am still willing to hope that the differences on the subject which exist or may hereafter arise between the governments will be amicably adjusted this subject however has already engaged the attention of the senate of the united states and requires no further comment in this communication the settlement of the question respecting the port of san juan de nicaragua and of the controversy between the republics of costa rica and nicaragua in regard to their boundaries was considered indispensable to the commencement of the ship canal between the two oceans which was the subject of the convention between the united states and great britain of the nineteenth of april eighteen fifty accordingly a proposition for the same purposes addressed to the two governments in that quarter and to the mosquito indians was agreed to in april last by the secretary of state and the minister of her britannic majesty besides the wish to aid in reconciling the differences of the two republics i engaged in the negotiation from a desire to place the great work of a ship canal between the two oceans under one jurisdiction and to establish the important port of san juan de nicaragua under the government of a civilized power the proposition in question was assented to by costa rica and the mosquito indians it has not proved equally acceptable to nicaragua but it is to be hoped that the further negotiations on the subject which are in train will be carried on in that spirit of conciliation and compromise which ought always to prevail on such occasions and that they will lead to a satisfactory result i have the satisfaction to inform you that the executive government of venezuela has acknowledged some claims of citizens of the united states which have for many years past been urged by our charge d'affaires at caracas 
it is hoped that the same sense of justice will actuate the congress of that republic in providing the means for their payment the recent revolution in buenos aires and the confederated states having opened the prospect of an improved state of things in that quarter the governments of great britain and france determined to negotiate with the chief of the new confederacy for the free access of their commerce to the extensive countries watered by the tributaries of the la plata and they gave a friendly notice of this purpose to the united states that we might if we thought proper pursue the same course in compliance with this invitation our minister at rio de janeiro and our charge d'affaires at buenos aires have been fully authorized to conclude treaties with the newly organized confederation or the states composing it the delays which have taken place in the formation of the new government have as yet prevented the execution of those instructions but there is every reason to hope that these vast countries will be eventually opened to our commerce a treaty of commerce has been concluded between the united states and the oriental republic of uruguay which will be laid before the senate should this convention go into operation it will open to the commercial enterprise of our citizens a country of great extent and unsurpassed in natural resources but from which foreign nations have hitherto been almost wholly excluded the correspondence of the late secretary of state with the peruvian charge d'affaires relative to the lobos islands was communicated to congress toward the close of the last session since that time on further investigation of the subject the doubts which had been entertained of the title of peru to those islands have been removed and i have deemed it just that the temporary wrong which had been unintentionally done her from want of information should be repaired by an unreserved acknowledgment of her sovereignty i have the satisfaction to inform you that the course pursued by peru has been creditable to the liberality of her government before it was known by her that her title would be acknowledged at washington her minister of foreign affairs had authorized our charge d'affaires at lima to announce to the american vessels which had gone to the lobos for guano that the peruvian government was willing to freight them on its own account this intention has been carried into effect by the peruvian minister here by an arrangement which is believed to be advantageous to the parties in interest our settlements on the shores of the pacific have already given a great extension and in some respects a new direction to our commerce in that ocean a direct and rapidly increasing intercourse has sprung up with eastern asia the waters of the northern pacific even into the arctic sea have of late years been frequented by our whalemen the application of steam to the general purposes of navigation is becoming daily more common and makes it desirable to obtain fuel and other necessary supplies at convenient points on the route between asia and our pacific shores our unfortunate countrymen who from time to time suffer shipwreck on the coasts of the eastern seas are entitled to protection besides these specific objects the general prosperity of our states on the pacific requires that an attempt should be made to open the opposite regions of asia to a mutually beneficial intercourse it is obvious that this attempt could be made by no power to so great advantage as by the united states whose constitutional system excludes every idea of distant colonial dependencies i have accordingly been led to order an appropriate naval force to japan under the command of a discreet and intelligent officer of the highest rank known to our service he is instructed to endeavor to obtain from the government of that country some relaxation of the inhospitable and antisocial system which it has pursued for about two centuries he has been directed particularly to remonstrate in the strongest language against the cruel treatment to which our shipwrecked mariners have often been subjected and to insist that they shall be treated with humanity he is instructed however at the same time to give that government the amplest assurances that the objects of the united states are such and such only as i have indicated and that the expedition is friendly and peaceful notwithstanding the jealousy with which the governments of eastern asia regard all overtures from foreigners i am not without hopes of a beneficial result of the expedition should it be crowned with success the advantages will not be confined to the united states but as in the case of china will be equally enjoyed by all the other maritime powers i have much satisfaction in stating that in all the steps preparatory to this expedition the government of the united states has been materially aided by the good offices of the king of the netherlands 
the only European power having any commercial relations with Japan. In passing from this survey of our foreign relations, I invite the attention of Congress to the condition of that department of the government to which this branch of the public business is entrusted. Our intercourse with foreign powers has of late years greatly increased, both in consequence of our own growth and the introduction of many new states into the family of nations. In this way, the Department of State has become overburdened. It has, by the recent establishment of the Department of the Interior, been relieved of some portion of the domestic business. If the residue of the business of that kind, such as the distribution of congressional documents, the keeping, publishing, and distribution of the laws of the United States, the execution of the copyright law, the subject of reprieves and pardons, and some other subjects relating to interior administration, should be transferred from the Department of State, it would unquestionably be for the benefit of the public service. I would also suggest that the building appropriated to the State Department is not fireproof, that there is reason to think there are defects in its construction, and that the archives of the government in charge of the department, with the precious collections of the manuscript papers of Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison, and Monroe, are exposed to destruction by fire. A similar remark may be made of the buildings appropriated to the War and Navy Departments. The condition of the Treasury is exhibited in the annual report from that department. The cash receipts into the Treasury for the fiscal year ending the 30th June last, exclusive of trust funds, was $49,728,386.89, and the expenditures for the same period, likewise exclusive of trust funds, were $46,007,896.20, of which $9,455,815.83 was on account of the principal and interest of the public debts, including the last installment of the indemnity to Mexico under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, leaving a balance of $14,632,136.37 dollars in the Treasury on the first day of July last. Since this latter period, further purchases of the principal of the public debt have been made to the extent of $2,456,547.49, and the surplus in the Treasury will continue to be applied to that object whenever the stock can be procured within the limits as to price authorized by law. The value of foreign merchandise imported during the last fiscal year was $207,240,101 and the value of domestic productions exported was $149,861,911, besides $17,204,026 of foreign merchandise exported, making the aggregate of the entire exports $167,065,937. Exclusive of the above, there was exported $42,507,285 in specie, and imported from foreign ports $5,262,643. In my first annual message to Congress, I called your attention to what seemed to me some defects to the present tariff, and recommended such modifications as in my judgment were best adapted to remedy its evils and promote the prosperity of the country. Nothing has since occurred to change my views on this important question. Without repeating the arguments contained in my former message in favor of discriminating protective duties, I deem it my duty to call your attention to one or two other considerations affecting this subject. The first is the effect of large importations of foreign goods upon our currency. Most of the gold of California, as fast as it is coined, finds its way directly to Europe in payment for goods purchased. In the second place, as our manufacturing establishments are broken down by competition with foreigners, the capital invested in them is lost, thousands of honest and industrious citizens are thrown out of employment, and the farmer, to that extent, is deprived of a home market for the sale of his surplus produce. In the third place, the destruction of our manufacturers leaves the foreigner without competition in our market, and he consequently raises the price of the article sent here for sale, as is now seen in the increased cost of iron imported from England. The prosperity and wealth of every nation must depend upon its productive industry. The farmer is stimulated to exertion by finding a ready market for his surplus products and benefited by being able to exchange them without loss of time or expense of transportation for the manufactures which his comfort or convenience requires. 
this is always done to the best advantage where a portion of the community in which he lives is engaged in other pursuits but most manufactures require an amount of capital and a practical skill which cannot be commanded unless they be protected for a time from ruinous competition from abroad hence the necessity of laying those duties upon imported goods which the constitution authorizes for revenue in such a manner as to protect and encourage the labor of our own citizens duties however should not be fixed at a rate so high as to exclude the foreign article but should be so graduated as to enable the domestic manufacturer fairly to compete with the foreigner in our own markets and by this competition to reduce the price of the manufactured article to the consumer to the lowest rate at which it can be produced this policy would place the mechanic by the side of the farmer create a mutual interchange of their respective commodities and thus stimulate the industry of the whole country and render us independent of foreign nations for the supplies required by the habits or necessities of the people another question wholly independent of protection presents itself and that is whether the duties levied should be upon the value of the article at the place of shipment or where it is practicable a specific duty graduated according to quantity is ascertained by weight or measure all our duties are at present ad valorem a certain percentage is levied on the price of the goods at the port of shipment in a foreign country most commercial nations have found it indispensable for the purpose of preventing fraud and perjury to make the duties specific whenever the article is of such a uniform value in weight or measure as to justify such a duty legislation should never encourage dishonesty or crime it is impossible that the revenue officers at the port where the goods are entered and the duties paid should know with certainty what they cost in the foreign country yet the law requires that they should levy the duty according to such cost they are therefore compelled to resort to very unsatisfactory evidence to ascertain what that cost was they take the invoice of the importer attested by his oath as the best evidence of which the nature of the case admits but every one must see that the invoice may be fabricated and the oath by which it is supported false by reason of which the dishonest importer pays a part only of the duties which are paid by the honest one and thus indirectly receives from the treasury of the united states a reward for his fraud and perjury the reports of the secretary of the treasury heretofore made on this subject show conclusively that these frauds have been practiced to a great extent the tendency is to destroy that high moral character for which our merchants have long been distinguished to defraud the government of its revenue to break down the honest importer by a dishonest competition and finally to transfer the business of importation to foreign and irresponsible agents to the great detriment of our own citizens i therefore again most earnestly recommend the adoption of specific duties wherever it is practicable or a home valuation to prevent these frauds i would also again call your attention to the fact that the present tariff in some cases imposes a higher duty upon the raw material imported than upon the article manufactured from it the consequence of which is that the duty operates to the encouragement of the foreigner and the discouragement of our own citizens for full and detailed information in regard to the general condition of our indian affairs i respectfully refer you to the report of the secretary of the interior and the accompanying documents the senate not having thought proper to ratify the treaties which have been negotiated with the tribes of indians in california and oregon our relations with them have been left in a very unsatisfactory condition in other parts of our territory particular districts of country have been set apart for the exclusive occupation of the indians and their right to the lands within those limits has been acknowledged and respected but in california and oregon there has been no recognition by the government of the exclusive right of the indians to any part of the country they are therefore mere tenants at sufferance and liable to be driven from place to place at the pleasure of the whites the treaties which have been rejected propose to remedy this evil by allotting to the different tribes districts of country suitable to their habits of life and sufficient for their support this provision more than any other it is believed led to their rejection and as no substitute for it has been adopted by congress it has not been deemed advisable to attempt to enter into new treaties of a permanent character although no effort has been spared by temporary arrangements to preserve friendly relations with them if it be the desire of congress to remove them from the country altogether or to assign to them particular districts more remote from the settlements of the whites it will be proper to set apart by law the territory which they are to occupy 
and to provide the means necessary for removing them to it. Justice alike to our own citizens and to the Indians requires the prompt action of Congress on this subject. The amendments proposed by the Senate to the treaties which were negotiated with the Sioux Indians of Minnesota have been submitted to the tribes who were parties to them and have received their assent. A large tract of valuable territory has thus been opened for settlement and cultivation, and all danger of collision with these powerful and warlike bands has been happily removed. The removal of the remnant of the tribe of Seminole Indians from Florida has long been a cherished object of the government, and it is one to which my attention has been steadily directed, admonished by past experience of the difficulty and cost of the attempt to remove them by military force, resort has been had to conciliatory measures. By the invitation of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, several of the principal chiefs recently visited Washington, and whilst here acknowledged in writing the obligation of their tribe to remove with the least possible delay. Late advices from the special agent of the government represent that they adhere to their promise, and that a council of their people has been called to make their preliminary arrangements. A general immigration may therefore be confidently expected at an early day. The report from the General Land Office shows increased activity in its operations. The survey of the northern boundary of Iowa has been completed with unexampled dispatch. Within the last year, 9,522,953 acres of public land have been surveyed and 8,032,463 acres brought into market. Acres in the last fiscal year there were sold 1,553,071, located with bounty land warrants, 3,201,314, located with other certificates, 115,682, making a total of 4,870,067. In addition, there were, reported under swamp land grants, 5,219,188. For internal improvements, railroads, etc., 3,025,920 making an aggregate of 13,115,175, being an increase of the amount sold and located under land warrants of 569,220 acres over the previous year. The whole amount thus sold, located under land warrants, reported under swamp land grants, and selected for internal improvements exceeds that of the previous year by 3,342,372 acres, and the sales would, without doubt, have been much larger, but for the extensive reservations for railroads in Missouri, Mississippi, and Alabama. Acres for the quarter ending 30th September 1852, there were sold 243,255, located with bounty land warrants 1,387,116, located with other certificates 15,649, reported under swamp land grants, 2,485,233, making an aggregate for the quarter of 4,131,253. Much the larger portion of the labor of arranging and classifying the returns of the last census has been finished, and it will now devolve upon Congress to make the necessary provision for the publication of the results in such form as shall be deemed best. The apportionment of representation on the basis of the new census has been made by the Secretary of the Interior in conformity with the provisions of law relating to that subject, and the recent elections have been made in accordance with it. I commend to your favorable regard the suggestion contained in the report of the Secretary of the Interior that provision be made by law for the publication and distribution, periodically, of an analytical digest of all the patents which have been or may hereafter be granted for useful inventions and discoveries, with such descriptions and illustrations as may be necessary to present an intelligible view of their nature and operation. The cost of such publication could easily be defrayed out of the patent fund, and I am persuaded that it could be applied to no object more acceptable to inventors and beneficial to the public at large. An appropriation of $100,000 having been made at the last session for the purchase of a suitable site and for the erection, furnishing, and fitting up of an asylum for the insane of the District of Columbia and of the Army and Navy of the United States, the proper measures have been adopted to carry this beneficent purpose into effect. End of Section 7 Recording by Mark Ernest